Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Um, we're going to talk today about um, forced migration. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically the context of Europe, but this is not a European problem. This is a global problem. And um, this is, we have 65 million forced migrants. Um, CSIS has a bipartisan task force to look at the forced migration crisis. There's more forced migrants today than any time in the world, more than in World War II, which was around 62 million. Um, we have, there's a whole series of reasons for it. It's conflict, it's weak states, there's lack of economic opportunity. Um, there's a whole series of challenges. Ultimately, what we need is for um, economic growth and jobs. We need peace. Uh, we need a whole series of, con of contexts. I was in Honduras earlier this week, and I was with the president of Honduras. The president of Honduras said, you know, it's lamentable for Honduras to have its best people and its young people leave Honduras to start a life somewhere else. I want the Hondurans to stay in Honduras and grow and prosper. And most Hondurans want to do the same. And so I know that is a common refrain across the world, whether it's in the Northern Triangle, whether it's in the Sahel, whether it's in Southeast Asia, this is a global problem. The other thing I want to just mention is there's both a, a root cause problem, or there's conversations about root causes, but then there's also the issues of integration, assimilation, security. Um, and these aren't just academic conversations. There's also a, there's an incredible political component to this. And frankly, um, the challenge of the forced migration crisis is moving is putting all sorts of things at risk. The liberal world order that, um, that we all value and benefit from, I think is also being put at risk by this. It's also impacting elections, and people are making political decisions uh, based on this, sometimes out of fear, and some of those fears are, you know, I think we, to denigrate those fears is dangerous, uh, and thinking about how we manage fear, I think is perhaps one of the other problems we have to talk about. The final point I wanna make is the issue of security. I think ultimately solving these problems is not about, um, is not just about border security. That is a sugar high solution or a putting a Band-Aid on a much deeper problem. Um, and so it's not enough. And it's uh, maybe politically, um, politically attractive, but it's ultimately not gonna be enough. I, we had conversations earlier this week with a non-European country and a non-United States country. Uh, with their border security leadership, uh, or uh, representatives of their border security agency, and they have a very robust border security policy towards forced migrants. And they said, since we've implemented it, we know that there's a rising pool of people waiting just over our horizon, increasingly so, waiting for us to, for either to kind of like out, outsmart or outthink the, the security issues, or to wait until there's a relaxation. So we know that border security alone is not going to solve this large problem. So I'm very grateful that my friends in the Italian government said that we, could, we should have a conversation about this around the time of the World Bank Group. I'm really, it's been a privilege and an honor um, to work with my friend Laura Frigenti, who's the director for the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, AICS. Um, Laura, if I may, I, I would consider you one of the stars of international development. And I think that this is someone to watch, and this is somebody who is a thinker, and a doer, and an innovator, and is somebody who cares deeply about the issues as well. Um, so it's really wonderful. Laura, can I ask you to make some opening remarks, and then we'll have a panel conversation after that. Please, Laura, come on up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to start uh, with thanking Dan and his team uh, for having this event, and I also want to say immediately that all he said about me is absolutely not true, and it's only because um, he's nice. <laughs> so, um, we really wanted to, uh, you know, have a conversation here in Washington about our experience, and I know that we have 
uh, titled this event uh, about migration and the impact of migration on Europe, I, of course, am going to give a particular angle, which is the angle from Italy, which we like to think uh, is the southern border of Europe, though uh, sometimes we felt that we were a little bit left on our own. But um, so let me start with just giving a little bit of perspective. Italy is a country of migrants. There was a study in the 90s of the Agnelli Foundation that actually showed that there were more uh, people of Italian descent outside of Italy than there were Italians in Italy. We have incredibly successful communities in the United States, uh, in Latin America, in Australia, in the richest part of Europe. These were all people that left on the boat, not as dangerous as the boats that we see in the Mediterranean uh, these days, but they left with nothing, thinking that they were entitled to have better opportunities somewhere and came here. Some of you may be the descendant of this uh, Italian migrant, of which we are very proud. Uh, so we thought that we really knew a lot about migration, that, uh, and also because we like to think about ourselves as nice, warm, open-minded, welcoming people, we really thought that uh, you know, we were going to handle this phenomenon uh, pretty well. And then the more we had big headlines on the newspaper, and every day there is a big title that says a thousand more, two thousand arrived today, and so many more thousands, etc. That really created a kind of a panic uh, in the society. And we realized that we didn't know uh, some parts of ourselves, some aspects of ourselves, and that we were probably not as nice and warm and welcoming as we thought that we would be uh, when, in a time of financial constraint, people were coming and were perceived to put a threat on our uh, you know, well-being, survival, opportunities, jobs, whatever. So this was a big... Um, a big topic for the government to confront. And I think that <coughs> for an agency like mine, that of course only handles one portion of this agenda, which is the impact that development can have on uh, migration. Of course, we are not concerned with you know, the people that are coming into Italy and uh, you know, the process of the accolades and integration, et cetera, et cetera. But we really try to have a conversation among ourselves and see uh, what can we do uh, to really shift a little bit the perspective on this agenda. And we understood pretty quickly two things. The first one is that it's, um, everybody is looking for the quick fix uh, to be able to make the big announcement that if we invest X amount of millions of euros and we are going to do this, the problem is going to go away. Tough luck, the problem is not going to go away for quite a while. And for one very simple reason, that uh, there has really been in the past couple of decades a change, uh, a cultural change in the youth, in particular in Africa. And they really feel that all the big things that they see happening in the other countries, that they are entitled to have them. And when they actually come to our shores and we interview them and we ask what was the driver of this decision, which at times, very often, is really dramatic, they just say that they wanted a better life for themselves and for their children. And that is what is driving all this. And the sense of entitlement, the sense that they also have a right to live better, is going to stay with them and is going to continue driving. So my um, impression and my message is that if we really think that uh, we can just build a barrier and keep these people out, this is just not going to happen. That they are going to find very creative ways to you know, break the barrier, to come through, because there is this aspiration that is incredibly important. The second thing is that, as I feel it was the same case with you know, the youth that from our villages in Sicily, in Calabria, they left and just came here. They want to go back home if they could. Uh, they really see the kind of a virtuous cycle that they manage to arrive safely to a place where they have a better life. They, 
put together their savings, and then they go back and actually build a better life in the place where they're coming from. So that actually one of the way of having a win-win approach to that is really to try to see how we can support this virtuous circle, how we can actually be creative in managing uh, this phenomenon. And so this is the reason why we um, put together this report uh, that provocatively we called towards a sustainable migration because we really wanted to make it clear that we didn't think that there was going to be an end, at least not in our uh, you know, professional lifespan. And I know that we are aging, but still we have a few years ahead of us. Uh, that really the issue was more about sustaining the process. And this, I think, that Professor Rosati from University of Tor Vergata, uh, who was the main author of the report will actually give you some sense of what is what that we tried to present in that report. Uh, the second thing that I think it's important is that uh, the moment that you start thinking about how to manage the process, then you really have to be much more proactive in deciding what you want to do. And in a way, we felt that you know we had been pretty receptive, pretty passive. People were coming and then we were trying to handle the crisis. And we started looking at uh, you know, experiences of other countries that actually did a lot and invested upfront, at source, we would say, uh, to make sure that the people that decided to do the voyage and come to Europe, to Italy in our case, that they actually were better equipped to in, uh, integrate themselves in the society, be more proactive, productive and actually work better. And so we did all sorts of things thinking about how to share information with them. Uh, this is what Italy is about. This is what is not, uh, you know, la la land. We also have our own constraints in terms of jobs and security, etc., etc. So it's not that you come here and there is any guarantee that uh, things are going to be fantastic. But this is how the culture of the place is. This is how the labor market works. This is how things are happening. And and we really tried to make sure that at least those that we could reach were prepared. And then we went a little bit further down and we started actually thinking about catching them before they even left their villages. And we very recently started this program where we actually send all trucks to this village and they show some little uh, you know, information like short movies about, first of all, the danger of the voyage and the trips that we have learned and the kind of things that they should avoid, uh, but then also what it is to be in Italy. And we did that uh, using the experience of a very powerful, I feel, force that we have with us, which is the strength of the diaspora that is living in Italy. And we are doing a lot of activities with them so that they can actually be the hinge that help us connect and help and support this community uh, you know, in their effort to have a better life. So um, all this to say that um, you know, I, I discuss this uh, very often with you know, our politicians that are always going to say, can we make a big announcement? Can we do this and say that this is a solution, that this is an impact? The reality is that this is really a long-term agenda that is going to stay with this world for quite a while. There are, of course, short-term actions that are going to help and assist, and um, we are going to present some of that. There is medium-term things, and there is the long solution, that long-term solution, that of course we all know, which is, you know, if these countries were to develop and grow in a more equitable way, of course people would have find opportunity close to home and stay there. But I think that, uh, you know, it's also very important and we see our role as a technical agency, really to be the honest broker and try to, uh, you know, have public opinion and people move away from the idea that there is a quick fix and that is just sufficient to create a handful of jobs in Niger and that people will stop coming. This is is just, unfortunately for them, uh, not going to happen. So thank you very much for being here, and I hope really that we are going to have an exciting panel and a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Laura. Thank you very much. F f let me start with you, Furio. So Furio, I actually read the report um, on uh, the, on the issue of uh, sustainable migration. You're a professor of public finance at the University of Tor Vergata in Rome, uh, but you also run an institute as well. And so I thought, I, mean, I read a lot of these reports. I'm in the business of report writing. It's actually an excellent report. Could you just talk a little bit about some of the, the points you make in the report and the title of it so people can go online and Google it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And 
<clears throat> thanks for having me here and for the, all the compliments uh, that you have spent on our work. Well, let me <clears throat> briefly get to the point uh, of the report. We started from um, a, a, an obvious element that um, also Laura has um, stressed. So migration is here to stay. This is one of the phenomena that is going to shape our world in the next uh, 50 years at least, like, if you want, uh, global warming. And migration is, it has been uh, beneficial to receiving country, to sending country, and hopefully also to the migrants uh, themselves. So if we want the issue is to remove from the expression that Daniel has been used, the adjective forced. So for sustainable migration, uh, we think about a flow of migrants who are well informed about the place where we are going, that they, where they are going, that they ponder their choice about whether to leave the home country or not, for how long to stay in the guest country, they are ready to be integrated in the labor market. They are ready to be integrated, I would say even more important, in the society of the destination country. And all this should happen not on uh, some uh, dangerous boats, but through possibly legal and well-organized channels. So this is the aim of the, uh, of the intervention, and this is what we need to do in the long run, starting today, though, because this is not a phenomenon that can, can be stopped. It's enough to look at the differential in the average uh, living condition and also in the social and political condition in several, in, uh, several countries. So what we have uh, identified is something to make concrete the statement that goes under various formats, and uh, in Italy a comedian put it very nicely, that we have two positions on, mi on migrants from the political party. One position is let them help there, and the other position is let's help them there, comma, really. <laughs> and I leave to you, I leave it to you to choose which political group use one of the slogans. So how can we help them and uh, there? Uh, it's necessary to put in place a, a, quite a broad set of policies. None of these policies is a, a silver bullet. None of them can solve by itself the problem can help us to achieve this flow of migration that is sustainable and beneficial in the long run, they need to be part of an integrated strategy. What we did is to focus on the possible uh, intervention in the country that are uh, origin from which the mi migrants uh, originate. Of course, uh, these policies, even if well designed and integrated, as would be nice to have them, needs then to be linked with the migration policies of the Austin country. But in this report, we only focus on this group of policies. We have, and I, let me be very brief here, we can come back to, to, to some details later. So first we want to make, we have a set of policies that aims to make migration a choice and to get the migrants ready. So let's reduce the pressure a little bit in the labor market, maybe improve slightly the condition of the labor market in the country of origin, so active labor market policies. I don't know, I don't need now to, to go into the details of this. But they, these active labor market policies, they do something. Something is, that something is not enough. So don't think we can, as also Lara was saying, we can invest something in this country and change substantially the labor market. This help, especially for youth, to reduce the pressure, but it's not the measure that solves the issue. So people, even if hopefully not under this desperate condition, are going to migrate. And they, we want them to be ready for when they reach the country of destination. So we need to support education, oriented to provide skill useful to migration. We want to support training for the kind of jobs they are going to face. And possibly a training can, can be tagged also by direct foreign investment. So ideally firms who plan to uh, have needs of labor force from uh, uh, foreign countries, they could have uh, plans 
in the country of origin on the migrants and so that they can have already a trained labor force very specifically for what, uh, for what are their needs. Also extremely important given the social and political tension that the four migrants is generating is the preparation of migrants to the kind of society they are going to find in the country of destination and if formation about how they need to integrate or at least to be, you know, uh, to understand the society they are going to, uh, to be there. So this package, I mean, that can be articulated in more detail, helps to, in, you know, to release the pressure, relieve the pressure and prepare the migrants. But also, as we know from the experience of many of the migrants uh, uh, of Italian origin, a large part of them would like to come back home at a certain point of their life. So we need to make migration not necessarily a final decision for the life of the individual. We need to favor the possibility of coming back to the home country. And there are a set of interventions that are very interesting in this part, uh, in this area. First of all, we have uh, the possibility of supporting circular migration so migrants that temporarily move to a country, maybe for a season or maybe for a few years, to work there and then come back, and then maybe go back again uh, in, in the future. There are a lot of issues with this, uh, with some of the aspects of circular migration, but it's a very important element. Also, we need to support the returns of migrants, because Many, many people would like to go back to the home country once they finish working, and so there must be a system in place, both in the country of destination, but also in the country of origin, to ensure that these people can come back, can invest correctly, and can make a good use of the saving they had during their working life uh, abroad. All this can be supplemented by the involvement of the diaspora in different way. There are some positive experience in this area, also unfortunately some uh, rather negative uh, experience. But of course having a diaspora that is involved, that is active, that keep the links with the country of origin would be very important both for this aspect but also for the aspects of integration. Finally, we should not uh, forget that the large part of the migrants leave home somebody. And normally they leave home the children, especially in the first phase, but most of, uh, quite a few of them in a permanent way, and leave them the old. These two groups are particularly vulnerable to the impact of migration, and we should have in place policies that protect these two groups to avoid that the effort of the generation who migrate are wasted in the family. And so that if they make an effort to improve the condition of their relatives at home, in fact, this fails and we have this two very weak group. Uh, for the moment, the attention has been given to uh, mainly to the issue of the children left behind. But as you know, fertility is reducing. And if we think uh, Asian countries, not so much in Africa for the moment, the issue of the old generation is becoming very pressing. So these are some of the pillars on which a policy in the country of origin that aims to ever <clears throat> obtain this kind of sustainable migration should be uh, centered. Let me briefly conclude with a very uh, negative note. So migration is at the center of the political debate or the economic debate, what we have invested, not only in terms of programs, is very small in this area. In terms of knowledge, we know nothing. We don't know what works, what doesn't work. There are no pilots. I'm happy to learn now from now that something going on. Maybe we can <laughs> do some impact evaluation. So the amount of resources in terms of actual intervention, I have a student who is now trying to put up all the figures and compare them to the investment uh, on uh, other sectors, but also in terms of knowledge is really, really very low. So there is an urgency to improve resources, but also to improve resources a little bit on knowledge so that we know what we are doing. 
Thank you. Thank you. For you, I want to take advantage of, of, of the fact that you're with me. So I want to hold this up. This is his report towards, I, like I said, I read a lot. I'm in the reports business. This is an excellent report. And I want to encourage you to read it. It's called Towards, Towards Sustainable Migration Interventions in Countries of Origin by I, uh, this is the, uh, it's funded by AICS, but it's uh, the Italian Center for International Development, which is uh, something that you're also involved yes. with, right? Okay, so I highly recommend this. Okay, but Furio, I, um, I'm looking at the, I read the newspaper, and there's been some, Italy's been in the news as it pertains to migration recently. I've seen polls that say 50% of Italians, and I think if you just change the word Italians to the United States, you'd have a similar polling, so this isn't picking on Italy. 50% of Italians think that the un un unmanaged migration, or whatever you want to call it, is a threat to public order. Uh, and maybe see it as a zero-sum game. Are there parts of Italy, we're doing this, this project, we're visiting Detroit, we're visiting Boise, Idaho, we're visiting California, where for a variety of demographic reasons or other reasons, there's been, there are some parts of the United States that see the migration as a benefit or something they welcome. Are there examples in Italy where either because I mean, Italy has very low migration, I mean, low demography, are there certain places in Italy where um, this migration is welcome and they are seeking it? I've often we've been looking, focused, particularly at cities, and looking at specifically city governments as opposed to national governments when we talk about this. I'd be curious about your reaction to that. Um, well, there are two ways to answer this question. One is you should look at a movie with Diego Abatantuono some years ago that show you what would happen if all the migrants would disappear magically. And it's a very nice movie. If, if you want to, uh, a more economist answer to this, if it's more boring, I think the migrants are now, the, the, there is a kind of dichotomy in the perception. So if you are looking at the service sector, at some industries, it's clear the migrants are a pillar of our economy on the, if they are removed, it would be you know, a full tragedy. On the other hand, the public perception of the issue of migration is disconnected from the reality. There is really a kind of schizophrenic approach to this issue. So the labor market needs for migrants are clear, both in the, especially in the service sector and also in parts of the industry and parts of agriculture also if they are, you know, some of the conditions should, should be changed. But the perception of what migrants do to the economy and to the society are totally detached from what's happening in reality. So this is another issue that we would need to bridge to, you know, generate a debate on migration that is based on the facts. Okay. And, uh, let me, all right, let me just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to you and Laura, and uh, Laura, I'm going to skip over you, just if you might, just, I want to hear from the other two panels, and then I'm going to come back to you, because I want to, I've got some questions for you, but, um, uh, Father Riskovich, thanks for being here. Uh, Father Riskovich has been kind enough to invest his time to be part of this bipartisan task force or nonpartisan task force on uh, forced migration here at CSIS. Uh, you're a professor at Georgetown University, you also had a past, uh, period of your professional life. You were at Catholic University at one point, and you've worked on refugees and forced migration for a long time. I don't uh, want to put you too much on the spot, Father Riskovich, but when I called the Vatican and I talked to them, there were a couple things I learned. One is that in the Vatican, and I'm Catholic, I, but I didn't know this about the Vatican, that the different departments are run by different cardinals. In the case of refugees, the Pope runs the department. On refugees. So there, I met a priest and I said, well, who's your boss? He said, well, I report directly to the Pope on this issue. So, and so we said, we would like someone from the Vatican involved in this task. Said, well, well we, we know a guy, they said. And then so the next thing you knew, I, I met with Father Riskovich. So it, he's somebody that um, the Vatican listens closely to um, on these issues. So Father Riskovich, thanks for being here. Um, I uh, know you've thought a lot about these issues and I'm glad you're here. Thank you for investing your time. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan, very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, my remarks today are going to stem from the fact that Dan mentioned I've been working very closely with the Vatican and with my fellow Jesuit, the Pope Francis, who uh, is very, 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 almost, as I say, obsessed with the migration issue and, and refugees. 
and uh, he really has his aim at really globally having an impact on the whole situation of migration. And it's starting to show, and I'll speak about that in a moment. The other fact is that in the 1990s, uh, I was executive director of the largest refugee resettlement agency in the world. It was run by the Catholic Church in the United States, and we work closely with other faith-based resettlement agencies like the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, like the uh, Episcopal uh, Immigration Ministries, like uh, the Jewish agency HIAS, uh, also s some secular agencies like the International Rescue Committee. And together, we resettle thousands and thousands of refugees from around the world that were cleared through the State Department and then turned over to us. And then we, we, we sort of make sure they got rooted in the United States. And it was a tremendous success. It was, it was in, uh, when I look back, I, I'm almost stunned by how successful it was in integrating, and not just resettling refugees, but integrating refugees into the culture and society of the United States. And uh, after I moved, from Washington to uh, Oxford University, where I, t I taught in the Refugee Studies Center as a tutor, I, um, I started entering into dialogue with my European colleagues about why resettlement was such a problem in Europe. You know, they didn't seem to have the same uh, sort of understanding of it. That, that the United States that we did. And then I realized after a lot of conversation and reflection that it was really, uh, I had to focus on the elements, the cultural and almost philosophical elements, elements that characterized each of the European cultures because it wasn't enough to characterize the European Union. You had to look at Italy you really had to look at France and at Germany and the way they approached the whole problem of integration particularly and how, how they uh, looked at it. And uh, I, I'm going to give you, uh, you know, my, my own summary of this. What we learned in the United States is the, the, the importance of three things. One is the freedom to work, the importance of the job, and the second is the freedom to move, mobility. And the third is the role of the faith communities in successful integration into society. And the first, I, the freedom to work. In the United States, finding work for the refugees as soon as possible, finding them jobs, was an absolute priority. It, the labor market was, it was very important to understand the labor market and how to get refugees jobs within that context. And, uh, and it was far more important than learning English. Uh, I know in some countries, you know, you have, to, you have to spend a year to learn the language before you can get a job. You know, well, we took the opposite point of view because we found pe people could learn, the refugees could learn English much faster in the context of work, in the workplace. That's where they picked up English most quickly. And uh, we decided that, again, was the priority. And, and also supporting their family earning an income gave them an important sense of dignity that they were looking for in, in their new life. It was a very important element of, of their... Uh... The second is freedom to move. Quite often, we'd, we'd put refugee families in Maine and suddenly they'd turn up in Miami, you know, and uh, of course the U.S. government and, and the state governments and the local charities are very upset by this because they turn around, the people they are brought in disappear, you know, and they show up in another state, in another context. And, uh, but I learned uh, early on that this kind of sec secondary, we called it secondary migration, was actually quite healthy and very important. I had a uh, famous Jesuit sociologist who once taught me that immigrants must integrate out of strength never out of weakness or vulnerability. And strength comes from being with other refugees from the same or similar cultures where they can share the same food, the same weather, the same cel celebrations, and in many cases, the same religious faith. 
And this was very important as a, as a, a stepping stone in the integration process. And, and finally, the, uh, uh, my final point, which is the role of religious faith communities in building what sociologists call the social capital of the refugees, the trusted network that builds their strength as a community. And the Catholic Church in the United States years ago built hundreds of ethnic parishes and ethnic schools, and it, it was through that network of institutions that Italians became Italian Americans, and that Germans became German American, and that the French became French American, and, and on and on and on for all the different groups, Catholic groups anyway, that we resettled. And, and the church was the major social engine in introducing core American values, as well as training uh, people in how to participate in the political process in the United States and how to actually invest themselves into politics. And it, it all came through that faith community uh, initiative. And uh, you know, you have to ask, well, why, why hasn't this happened in Europe? And I have many reasons I can give you, but in my discussions, I found that they, there's a, this distinct core of values in each country that have to be taken into consideration before you understand how they're approaching the movement of, of foreigners into the country itself. And I'm gonna use one example. I'm not picking on this example. I mean, I respect the Nordic states very much. They're, they're the most generous group of states in the world in terms of refugees. But I lived in Sweden and Denmark for several years, and I learned that, uh, well, back in the early 20th century, Per Alban Hansen, who eventually became prime minister in Sweden, who eventually became that, uh, pushed the idea of Sweden as what he called a people's home. Uh, it was folkhemmet, it says in Swedish, folkhemmet, a kind of socialist homeland which valued equality and moderation above everything else. And that notion of equality and moderation took hold in the feelings of the people themselves, you know, that, that, that this was extremely important to be a Swede. You know, you, you had to have this as part of your folk uh, home, people's home. And even the old myths about the Vikings passing their, their uh, you know, cup around and each Viking should take just enough, not too much, because you have to make sure there's enough for the Viking next to him. You know, so the, and that became part of the public philosophy that you, know, you don't want to become too rich. If you're gonna to become too rich, we're gonna tax you and give it to the rest of the homeland. You know, it's this idea of um, uh, uh, modesty in a way. And in, in Denmark and Sweden, fitting in is not, it means a lot. It means not standing out. And out of this has developed an extremely generous uh, social policy of fairness, equality, uh, almost a, a live and let live uh, approach to foreigners coming into, into the Nordic countries. But in actuality, it has created a kind of condo community for the migrants. And I say that because people who are too loud, who are too intense, perhaps too religious, are not considered normal. And normality is extremely important to Swedish and Danish identity. I mean, it's, it, to, to be abnormal is never to be totally accepted into the people's home, because that's, the people's home should be characterized by that kind of normality. And that, uh, that sort of lesson uh, was not, not really, it was conveyed perhaps by the state, by the governments, but not accepted totally by the people. And that's where you're seeing the tension within the Nordic societies about the number of migrants coming into the country and uh, how it has to be addressed. And I, I uh, and the question, of course, becomes, how do you overcome these kind of things? Because I could do the same thing with France or Germany. I mean, Germany, where you have Turks 
who don't speak, they speak only German anymore, third generation Turks who don't have citizenship, you know, in, in Germany, you know, and you have to ask your question, well, what, you know, how are they going to integrate totally into the country if you're not even going to put them on a path to uh, uh, citizenship? And that goes again back to the, some of the cultural uh, foundations of the German state and how it looks at life and, and what it should be about. And I think, how do you overcome that? Well, I'm gonna to turn to, my, to our Pope Francis, who is trying to, he believes, and I talked to him personally about this several times, he believes that uh, religious values can transform and transcend cultural norms that are holding back people from welcoming migrants. That there are ways of transforming a culture, uh, through re particularly through religion, uh, where people start to stand outside of those usual norms that they have and uh, about their society and who should belong here and who should not, and to actually act. And he's trying to generate that across the globe, in starting with the local parishes. And we're starting to see some really deep effects because you have local people all over the world, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Africa, in the United States, uh, who are uh, actually responding to his plea to kind of get to know refugees, get to know migrants, start understanding where they're coming from, and try to understand how they might fit into your society. You know, and we're finding some success on that initiative, even here at Georgetown, where there's a very wealthy parish across the street from Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit parish, Trinity, and uh, they've taken on a refugee family as a parish, so that the whole community gets to know this, these fa this family, and they try to help them, and there's a lot of you know, dinners and conversation and everything that's going on. And I think that model is not a bad one for uh, trying to sort of seek some kinds of attitudinal changes that might help solve some of this migration problem. I, I respect very deeply what you said about finance and the labor market and, board, uh, and investing in, and the fact that Italian Americans, m most of our Italian, not most, but many of the Italian Americans went back to Italy to retire. That's how they ended up their life in Italy. You know, they didn't stay in the United States uh, after their life. And uh, many families have that. And I think that an important thing to consider in terms of when you accept refugee families that, you know, they may not always be here. You know, they can have dual citizenship or become a kind of, uh, have a kind of double life, if you want. And, and that's healthy. Anyway, sorry for taking so long. Father, Thank let you. me just take advantage of the fact that you have the floor and there to just ask a, a, two questions to you. So what do you say to somebody, whether it's in the United States or in Europe, who says, I'm, I fear refugees because they're going to take a job away from me or one of my children? That's the first question. And the second question is, I fear refugees because uh, the refugee comes from a religious background that's not not the same as my own, and I fear for sort of the future of my culture and or I have some concerns about other things that may be, that I may be a stereotype about, you know, I have, I have fears and stereotypes, if I can put it that way. So what do you say about those, how do you, how do you address those two fears? Well, the first one about, uh, I think there's plenty of research out there about the impact of immigration on societies economically. And what we found, at least certainly in the United States, but I know, I know I've read stuff in Europe too for the same thing, that it, it has very little impact except at the very lowest levels of society. I mean, what I mean is skilled. Negative impact. Yeah, negative impact, yeah. And so it does in some, uh, like I'll give you an example of Southern Florida. There were, there's evidence that uh, the competition for low-skill labor in Southern Florida was, it, was hurt by the migrants because of the pay scales going down and the ability to hire a migrant cheaper than you could hire a, a local unskilled worker. And that, that, is, that is an impact, but it's a much more manageable impact 
that could be addressed, then a massive impact on the, on the economy of the society as a whole. In fact, it benefits society as a whole. I think most of the research points out that it's, it, it ends up in the long run generating uh, a lot more than it actually takes from the refugee. Maybe initially there's a lot of costs in terms of public education or, or, or health care, uh, but eventually it's made up in terms of the taxes and other things that eventually, the, it, the more they're integrated, the more they pay and to, the more they're involved in ways that benefit society in general. And then the second thing about the religious uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's a kind of sense of alien, uh, an alien religion almost. It's a sense that, you know, this faith, I don't really trust it or I, I don't really know. And, and we experienced that in the United States uh, from ca on John Adams and Catholics or Jesuits. He wanted to throw Jesuits out of the country because he thought you know, we were very suspicious and that we'd bring some kind of European values into the country that he didn't think was health healthy. So it's not an uncommon kind of fear. And in some cases, you know, you have to take that fear into consideration in your actual dialogue. I mean, that you can't, I don't think it helps to walk away from that. I think that's one of the things I notice. We have these like very nice gatherings, you know, and every, every, nobody really talks about the, the problem in the room, you know, which is, you know, I don't really trust the, you know, the, those folks over there, you know, and no one wants to say that because it's, you know, it just sounds awful. But, but in fact, there is a lot of fear, and it has to be addressed directly. You can't, you can't not directly address it. And, I th and I've seen ways of, very, of addressing it very well, and I think you can do that very well. But, but I don't think it should be ignored or try, try to hide it, you know, because I think it's, it's an important fear. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Okay, so Jonathan Prentice, you're the Chief of Staff for the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General for International Migration of the United Nations. That has got to be the second or the first longest title of anybody we've ever introduced. We excel at those. Really, really fabulous. But, but Jonathan, I think what it means is you, you spend a lot of time thinking about the issue of forced migration, and that's your day, your day job is to worry about that. And I know that the UN, um, there's been a series of commitment statements and sort of processes and commitments, if I can put it that way. Um, there's, this thing, there's a process or a series of things called the Global Compacts or Compacts, Compact that is, is part, of, uh, as part of this, and I know we're, we're um, uh, I think it's an, and then there's also the various international conventions that um, were set up immediately after, some of it having to do with World War II, and then pre, -world, pre the foundation of the United Nations, you had UNHCR, which I believe is, predates the, the founding of the, the United Nations. Is that it? it one of, one of the, there was an, one of the agencies that deals with migration of refugees started before the United Nations. I can't, one of them, I can't remember which one, but it's not, if it isn't UNHCR. Right. Anyways, Jonathan, tell us about, this is in your inbox. You have Secretary General Gutierrez who used to run UNHCR, so I suspect this is also a little, I mean, obsessed is perhaps, I suspect, a word that may relate to Secretary Guterres, Secretary General Guterres' thoughts about this as well. So the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you to everyone at CSIS for, for inviting me to this discussion. I'd like to say at the outset that uh, Father Richard failed the Viking test. Uh, all, <laughs> All of you have left me with nothing constructive to say. Uh, it, they were such wonderful interventions, so I'm, I'm uh, hugely benefited from those. Uh, secondly, I feel somewhat, and you can note from my accent that I'm, I'm British, that I've, I've brought a cricket bat to a baseball game. I, uh, um, <laughs> I don't deal with forced migration I deal with migration writ large, and I think therein lies actually a, a significant piece of the puzzle that I'd like to sort of unpack a, a, a little bit. Uh, and I'll, I'll say at the outset that this is self-evident, but it, it merits repeating. These are not easy policy issues. If they were easy policy issues, we wouldn't be here today discussing them, and there wouldn't be parallel discussions going on all over the world, not just in Europe, not just in the United States, but, but all over the world. The question of migration raises extremely tricky policy issues, 
and as we've heard from, from the other speakers, extremely tricky emotional ones. Uh, some of those we can agree with, some of those we can find distasteful, but it is very difficult, and in fact it would not be that productive simply to dismiss them uh, out of hand. I think also, frankly, there's a lack of widespread familiarity uh, with the issue. Uh, and this allows the notion of a crisis to prevail. Uh, when I would say that the overall story of migration is a positive one, uh, and the crises within it, and one shouldn't dismiss the fact that there are crises within it, are pathologies in what is an overwhelmingly uh, healthy organism. There's a lack of definitional clarity. We use refugees and migrants on an almost interchangeable uh, uh, basis. There's a lack of data out there. We really don't know enough on such a remarkable uh, and widespread phenomenon. Um, and we also face a challenge that the ultimate solution, I think, achieving sustainable migration, I very much agree with, with, with those interventions, that part of the, a key part of the ultimate solution to arriving at that end goal is seemingly counterintuitive, by which I mean that a key means of tackling irregular migration is going to have to include increasing regular migration. And, and the final point, that I wish to make uh, in my introductory comments is that we are also talking about human beings. Again, self-evident, but I think it merits repeating. There are 257 million migrants in the world today. That's three in every 100 people. We also have, in Europe, I can say we in Europe, I am European, an immense and tragic crisis, 13,000 deaths in the Mediterranean since 2013, nearly 9,000 deaths since Alan Kurdi died just over two years ago. People must be at the center of our concerns when we're thinking through solutions. Now, uh, when it comes to looking through solutions, I'd like to come up with a, 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 a couple of points. One is I think that policymakers need to address, and this is not unique to the migration sphere, and again, I stress, I know it is not easy, the, the age-old issue of what comes first, the change in the public sentiment or the sound public policy. Uh, and this is, I think, particularly relevant in the field of migration because migration policies require not just sound planning, but long lead times uh, if they're to uh, pay dividends. Uh, and these long lead times are not always in sync with fluctuations in, in the public mood. Uh, and achieving a state of regular migration, uh, I think, is in the interests of the state, completely legitimate interests of the state to understand who is and who isn't entering uh, crossing their borders, the interest of the state when it comes to meeting labor needs, when it comes to managing their own demographic uh, profiles. Uh, regular migration, I think, would contribute to easing significant pressures that are on the asylum systems in, in, in many countries in, in Europe. And of course, it's also in the interests of the migrant himself or herself to have regular routes rather than be risk, uh, rather than the risks inherent in, in, in irregular routes. So what does all this mean in trying to come up with, uh, with sound policies? One is, I think, to, to focus on the facts. And again, it's the overwhelmingly positive story that migration um, uh, has, to, has to say for itself. Secondly, I think this is important, is that not everything is a migration issue. And I think there is a tendency now that we are seeing migration in everything, uh, whether it be uh, development uh, study, whether it be how we approach development, uh, how we approach certain conflict issues. Uh, development is a good in and of itself. 
Thirdly, we should treat migration's pathologies as that, as pathologies that need to be addressed. Uh, and finally, I would suggest that we need to take care in how issues are framed. Um, I find a lot of the discourse on migration to be problematic. Some of it is obviously pejorative, you know, references to queue barges, swarms, people being fished out of the sea. Um, some of it is, is less so, but I think still problematic. Illegal migrants, economic migrants carry with it certain baggage and connotations in, in popular parlance. Um, I think some of the language is dry and dehumanizing. Stocks and flows is typically what one uses in agricultural terms, not, what, not when talking about uh, human beings. Uh, and some of it is, is, is simply misleading, you know, references, for example, to smuggler-driven uh, migration. Now, this isn't just an emotive point, it's also a, 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 a tactical or a strategic point, is there is a lot of this language is oppositional when, in fact, there is a vast amount of shared interests out there amongst all the states in the world. Laura mentioned in her opening comments that Italy's well known for being a, a country that has given migrants to the world. Increasingly, countries can no longer be typecast as either being singularly of origin or of destination. Increasingly, they're both. Uh, and therein, I think, lies potential for countries to understand each other, understand the challenges uh, um, and the potential that migration uh, brings, and shared solutions, hopefully, can be found. I don't wish to dismiss the task ahead, uh, but I, f I think finding those commonalities rather than focusing on the divisions is absolutely fundamental. I'll leave it there for the moment. I'll say more about the UN process if you wish, but. So Jonathan, let me just, let me just take advantage of the fact that you're, you're here and just, there's been a series, of, there were a series of international conventions about refugees in, after World War II. Is the current set of international agreements and arrangements uh, up to the task of dealing with the current situation that we find ourselves in as vis-a-vis Migration? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'll give you a bit more than that. Um, so uh, last year, the, 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 the member states of the United Nations came together and signed on to something called the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. Uh, uh, and this really was uh, an attempt by the UN system to look at the issue of people on the move across borders because it didn't deal with the how many 40 million internally displaced people uh, uh, to, to look in totality at the issue of human mobility uh, across borders. Now the refugees is the refugees are protected by and dealt with under the 1951 convention, which is really rather, you know, one of the most impressive pieces of international architecture set up post Second World War. There is no such convention for those who cross borders but are not refugees. And this has led to some of the challenges. So on the issue of non-refugee migration, the New York Declaration was extremely significant for, for three reasons. One is it recognized, and this is the membership of the UN system, it recognized migration's overall positive contribution to the world and its integral place in the, in the global development agenda, firstly. Secondly, it recognized and it agreed to a common goal, and that common goal is to facilitate safe, orderly, and regular migration. And the action verb facilitate, I would suggest to you, is significant and positive. And thirdly, it recognized explicitly that migration was both a global phenomenon and that dealing with its challenges required global solutions. 
So I think for all three of those reasons, the declaration marked a real milestone in, in how the international community deals with migration. And then it further went on to commit the membership two years after the New York Declaration to arrive at a global compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration. And that's what is being worked on at the moment. And so hopefully, knock on wood, a year from now, we will, we will arrive at that consensus view on how to deal with and optimize the potential of global uh, uh, migration. So now I have a question for, uh, I have two questions for Laura and Furio. Thank you. So Laura, there's been um, some news as well in, about Italy's uh, migration policy. There's been some, some, there was an article in uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations about changes in Italy's migration policy and there was some implication that perhaps it had something to do with elections and that there was, um, there had been some attempts to, there's many of the pathways to Italy come from Libya and that they often come on boats. And so there's been a, some criticism by human rights groups about either having to do with boats and having to, there's some, and then there's specific concerns about issues in, in Libya as well. I'd like to ask each of you just to respond to sort of the, that there's, you know, how, how do you, when someone, if someone writes an article that says it's either a political or the A or B, that is that there's there's a criticism of Italian policy vis-a-vis -vis Libya. What are bo both as Italian citizens? I'd be curious about your reaction to 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 something that's like that's out there like that. Yes, take please. Take a first stab. Fulio, in a way, is a private citizen. <laughs> it doesn't represent the government. So uh, let me just say a few things, just uh, as a context. When uh, all this migration crisis started, uh, the first thing that we did, uh, and I think I hinted that in my opening remarks, considering ourselves the southern border of the Union, we went to Brussels looking for uh, you know, European Union solutions. And it wasn't possible to uh, achieve an agreement on the absorption level uh, among the different countries. We then came up with a kind of a we thought proactive proposals, a migration compact of a plan of investment and allocating resources for managing the process better. Uh, that also didn't have much traction in Brussels. And uh, so we went ahead and we did our own Africa compact with our own resources at a time where Italy is constrained. Uh, and I think that for years, because when there has been a trade-off uh, between absorbing more people or saving lives in the Mediterranean, I think that we show a pretty clean record of saving lives. And uh, I have been uh, in government for two years. I changed, unfortunately, several prime ministers. I have to say that the sample is large enough to tell you that this is a policy that is shared by everybody in government. So whenever there is a life at risk, we save lives. That has been the fundamentals principle, the unnegotiable principle for us. That, of course, has brought an inflow of people that is very difficult to manage for a country that, as I said, is small, uh, had a very long contraction cycle in the economy, is just now recovering with a little bit less than 2% growth rate projected by the IMF, which seems fantastic for us, having been negative for a long time, is surely not enough to be a springboard for recovery for everybody else. So, and now we are approaching elections. So I have to say, elections. We don't know, as you never know in Italy, between now and February, <laughs> sometimes February is the deadline. So um, there is not a political party that uh, you know, would run this six months heading to elections saying we have an open border policy, we are uh, you know, keeping our aids open, please come. Uh, because that will be politically suicidal and that we have to be realistic. Uh, so what we have done was to try to do two fundamental things. The first one was to negotiate some agreements with all those who have boats to rescue so that the, this was done in a way that was regulated by some principles. Um, and the second thing was to, to go to Libya and negotiate a deal uh, so that, that the conditions of those people that are kept in Libya uh, were actually more humane 
we had a big push uh, with the United Nations. And I have to say that I think that Italy should be credited for having HCR and IOM back in Tripoli, boots on the grounds, which they hadn't been, and uh, uh, more agencies to come, I am told. And now I, our little agency, is launching uh, you know, a call for proposals for Italian NGOs. We have negotiated with uh, you know, the Libyan government uh, to allow our NGOs to go and actually uh, you know, enter in the detention centers and uh, uh, you know, change the way in which these people are managed. Now, this is far away from being a solution. But what I'm saying is that we are not just irresponsibly closing the border because we have election in February and saying, well, you know, we'll talk about that the moment that there is a new government in place. We have put in place a continuum. And uh, you know, I don't run for office, but I, I do see that uh, you know, there are concerns that obviously the reaction that is still so polarized in the public opinion. And I want just to say one thing. Um, we have been having recently a big debate on the use solely, so the, the law that would allow what you guys have here. If you're born in the United States, you automatically become a US citizen. And that's great. It's a foundation of an open society. We have thousands of young children that were born in Italy legally that uh, you know, are educated, uh, that feel that they are Italians, that went to the Italian schools. It was impossible to take this law through parliament because the discussion on the media was, you want to bring more migrants. These people have nothing to do with migrants. They're already there. They are in our schools. They work in our places. So uh, that's... Furio, as an Italian citizen, I'd like to also get your views on what I put to, I... Put to Laura. Well, let's say Loda gave a fair but optimistic picture of what uh, is going on, and, uh, but the principle is there. The, the, the problem that we have in Italy and that we have maybe in other countries is that the debate about migration is totally disconnected from reality. The evidence we are so concerned about uh, African migrants, and this may be in the next 10 years will be the case. For the moment, there are a minority of migrants in Italy. Uh, so all this debate that you see is it, it, not about policies. What I, uh, and so there must be a lot of work. Sometimes I think they should forbid to talk about migration <laughs> from now on until after the election so people can do their job and then they, uh, they can value. But this is really a work. Uh, uh, that would need to be done. I mean, to bring the debate a little bit closer to, to reality. And also uh, establishing some of the facts that Jonathan was mentioning, because there is a whole confusion. Everybody is a traffic person, even if they just want to pay a smuggler to come in. I mean, so th this will be uh, the crucial point. But there is one element in Italy, because, and, and I want to stress this as Italian, uh, what Laura said, that we don't like to, have, to see people suffering so much. So in the end, uh, years ago, there was a choice. There was an accident. And I don't know if you remember you were here. So we had very strict regulation of engagement to avoid that the boats would come. The first time something happened, and I don't remember, a certain number of people died, this fully changed. Now. <laughs> People are aware that less people is crossing the Mediterranean, but they're getting more and more aware of the conditions uh, in Libya. And so maybe some of the good work that the agency is doing will change, but this part will be there. So nobody will push for this agreement too much unless uh, you know, there, are some, there is some respect of the human rights also on the other side of the Mediterranean, to be a little okay. bit optimistic. Okay. Okay. So, Laura, let me just, I want to come back to you one last time, and then I want to open it up. My friend and mentor, Andrew Natsios, the former head of USAID, would say that the ultimate solution to migration or forced migration is about better development, that ultimately it's about jobs and better governance and citizen security and a feeling that you have a stake in your own society and that there's not conflicts. Maybe it's a little bit too idealistic, or and he, he didn't mean it in a simplistic way. But if you, I mean, I know if I look at the G20 process or if you even look at the G7 process, 
or you look at uh, the, various, the various processes in the United Nations, that certainly trying to grapple with these issues of, of push factors. So from where you sit and you have, a, you have an ability to help move on those issues, how, what do you think, when you think about Italy and what contribution it can make regarding push factors for migration, whether it's forced migration or economic migration, what are the sorts of things that Italy is doing now or, and what, is the, what are the sorts of things that other governments can do? And I will just make one other comment, which is having looked at this in the Northern Triangle in terms of forced migration in the Northern Triangle of Central America, it was clear to me that no government, whether it was the United States, the European Union, or Italy, or Japan, or Spain, any outside country on its own could, could do much. And it seemed to me that they would all have to work together if they were going to do anything. And my other big takeaway from the process of spending a year looking at it was something about the private sector and about trying to enable more job growth and private sector job growth in developing countries themselves was not the solution in, in, on its own, but that was a big part of the solution. So I'd welcome your thoughts, Laura. No, I would agree with Andrew Nassis, and I think that everybody would. That, you know, the, the, the long-term solution is local development, societies that are more equitable, that offer more opportunities. The point is that this is not what we are debating now. Because I think that if everybody could freeze the world as it is and say, let's all work uh, you know, at creating more global development in the different countries, and uh, you know, in the meanwhile, nobody moves, uh, then everybody would actually be willing to chip in and put some resources. The problem is that people are moving as we are speaking. So I think that the first important part is that we have really to be able to tell the true message to everybody, starting from our own politicians that keep asking for, can I have the silver bullet you call the quick fix solution? Um, you know, this is a long-term process. It's going to last decades. Uh, there are going to be some things that can help in the short term, for sure. The long term is development. A lot of that is also cracking on some very important things like the demographics. So if I think about a country like Niger, if they continue having a fertility rate of 7.8% per family, then there is no investment in the economy of such a small country that is going to be able to absorb that labor force that every year is thrown on the market. So we have to bring that 7.8 down to 3.5, to 3, to something that is more manageable. And this is something that, uh, you know, is a conversation that is awkward for many, but it's very much part of the solution. The second part is on investments, and uh, I think that you touched on that. I mean, this is not something that public money on its own can do, but public money needs to, uh, you know, user or decision makers on public money needs to think more creatively about they, how they can use their money to leverage private sector. A private investor, I think about our SMEs, they are not really eager to go to Niger. It's not an attractive market. So you have to put the incentives in place. This is what public money should be for. So we shouldn't be investing. We should actually be there creating incentives and then, as I said, I mean, really accept the fact that, uh, you know, uh, there have been generations before us that had different type of problems. The big challenge for this generation and the one to come, I'm afraid, is how are we going to find ways in which we live with the uncertainty that this flux of population poses on our country, where we talk a lot about what's happening, without actually, I feel, uh, you know, stressing the point that 90% of the migrants stays in countries that are next door to they were coming from. Uh, the Somali that lives from Somalia stay in Ethiopia, uh, in Sudan, in Kenya, and those economies are already fragile and stressed. And there is a lot that needs to be done to that. What comes to us is la creme de la creme, the tip of the iceberg, those who can pay the 5,000 euros to go across the Mediterranean and make the trip. There are others that actually cannot even afford that. They still move and they stop in transit countries. All right, I want to open up. You've been a very patient audience. I believe we have some microphones, right, Mr. Metzger? OK, so I want to hear from. Um, uh, my friend Alina and this woman here, uh, this woman here, and this young man here. So those four, okay? So yeah, that's you. The glasses. Can you yeah. Stand? So sure. these two hands, these sure. three, these three, and then this gentleman. Yep. 
And so we're going to do it, say your name and who you're with and keep the question brief and we'll get to four. Go ahead. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for putting together such a great discussion. Um, I think it's very interesting what you were talking about, Laura, about um, the family size in terms of uh, Africa and some of the developing countries that are sending their migrants um, to Europe. But I was interested in sort of the population um, discussion on the other side of it because of the aging of Europe. And in a lot of my friends who live in Italy and live, live in some of these countries where there's a lot of migrants, um, the, there's just smaller families and their elderly relatives are being taken care of by migrants. So what about having the smaller family and what the generation is going to look like in terms of opportunities uh, if you have a youth bulge in other countries and there's the aging of a population in Europe? Especially so, Italy. so, Alina, just say who you are and who oh, you're with. My name is Alina Zhishkovsky. I'm an independent consultant. And the woman okay. behind you. Hi, my name is Lona von der Voort. I'm a program associate at the Osgood Center for International Studies, and I have a question for Mr. Prentiss. Uh, you were talking about the protection of the rights of internally displaced uh, persons, um, and I'm interested in it because in the African Union in 2009, um, the Kampala Convention, was um, adopted, which um, allows the protection of these rights. Um, do you think it's possible that these types of um, frameworks are accepted in, in other regional organizations? Thank you. And this woman here. No, no, over here, this woman with the glasses. Yep. Thank you. My name is Rosie Berman. I'm currently job searching. My question is for Father Riskovich or for Mr. Prentice, depending if you both want to answer it, that's fine. And it is about how can we in host countries best address the non-rational fears, but still, how can we in host countries address the non-rational, but still very meaningful fears of our fellow citizens regarding refugee resettlement. Thank you. This gentleman here. Hello, my name is Max, and I'm a student at the George Washington University. I'm curious, um, you all spoke of the importance of increasing the situations in the development and the opportunities in the countries where these migrants are coming from. But in a majority of these countries, there's rampant corruption, human rights abuses, and even if you get private investments to go in, there's only so much good they can do if a majority of the money is being taken by the host government or other corrupt sources. So I'm curious how it would be how it should be balanced to where even if we're, when we're investing in the countries where they're coming from, be it in the Sahel, be it Gabon, be it Senegal, that the government is not coming in and taking the money and it ends up not doing as much as it could. I saw this woman over here wanted to make a comment. This will be the last person. So Becky could, or uh, Mr. Metzger, if you could pass the microphone to this woman here, please. Uh, hello, my name is Nancy Benjamin. I work on the Sahel at the World Bank. Um, and one of the issue, one of one of the things we found in the Sahel is that people who are moored and anchored by their families are unlikely to become recruits for extremist groups like Boko Haram, but the wash of refugees who have come from wherever are more likely. And there have been some discussion about uh, reintegration programs, um, return migration, reintegration, including some money or grants that allow people to reintegrate with a certain amount of dignity, including a lot of people who left soaking up a lot of savings from their village and who cannot return empty-handed, it just isn't possible for them to return empty-handed. So I'm, I'm wondering if there is a possibility that rather than having people get soaked by uh, traffickers and this and that all the way to Italy or anywhere else to get a grant to go home, if there, if there might be a possibility of some kind of constructive grant program that might catch them before they spend all this money uh, that might be uh, constructive in that, fact. because in fact the, the extremist groups are in fact using a grant approach to recruit people. So I was wondering if there's anything going along those lines. Thank you. I'm just gonna ask each of the panelists to just respond 
don't, don't answer all the questions, but if you could just take on one or two of the comments or questions, and I'm just going to ask each of the panelists to go ahead. I'm going to start with Furio and just go on down. Okay, very briefly um, on the investments. The, the, of course, I mean, it's very difficult to, in the long run, a uh, uh, strategy to change the, the condition in, in the country of origin. Uh, and the uh, institutions are crucial for this, and, but this we also know is one of these most difficult issues to address, I mean, how to change the institution. But also, um, I, I would like to make a, 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 just a, a remark. Th there is still a big bias in this, I mean, most of the questions is how we stop. Migration is essential to economic growth, has been essential over the centuries to economic growth. So the discussion should be how we benefit from these people and also benefiting them, I mean, not exploiting them. I think a little change in the discourse would also help, uh, for example, to address the irrational or even rational fears that people have about this. So it would be interesting in the future to open more discussion on how migration has been beneficial. I mean, we would be hunting bison here. Maybe people <laughs> would be much happier. Some of, yeah, yeah. Some of yeah, the yeah. people would be happier, hunting but bison. basically we'll be... We'd still be back yeah. hunting bison. Exactly, and we will be in Europe happy if right. doing something else. Bison burgers, I heard, are very good, by the way. Yeah. So uh, right, right. <laughs> well, I, you know, I just want to to say on this issue of uh, the mismatch in terms of the demographics. I think that that is something that is very clear. I think actually one of our politicians um, a few months ago, she said that uh, we are entrusting the most precious things that we have, which is our parents, our elderly people, uh, to migrants, because this is what de facto uh, is happening in the country. And so that really there should be a sense of the fact that we just don't have sufficient labor force to cover certain sectors. And I, uh, you know, having been at the World Bank for many years, I have this uh, vice of, you know, thinking things rationally. And I'm asked by the government very often to go and talk in cities and talk to people about what we are doing on this agenda. And really, even from the economic point of view, I mean, we are now a country of 60 million people. Uh, we are working and planning our investment plan to cover the needs of a market of 60 million. If we leave this to our own demographics, we are going to be like Holland in uh, a generation. And maybe it's good. Maybe we want to be like Holland. We want to be a much smaller country. But if we don't, then the only way for us to actually remain where we are is that we open our borders and that we absorb people that want to come and work with us. Yeah, uh, I think I want to address uh, the, the issue of fear, uh, this question of how do you deal with people that are really, really fearful, honestly. And I, and I, I think the, the first step is recognizing their fear. The first step is acknowledging their fear. And, and most importantly, it's exposing the migrants to the fear uh, because they don't, they don't understand exactly. My, my, uh, my address, and I, I, I deal with a lot of directly with refugees and migrants you know, in, their, their, uh, in their home countries, and I often tell them, you have a responsibility to the host country, to the country that brought you in. And, and that's not a small matter. It's not something you can ignore. You have to do, you have to understand their fears and you have to address their fear. And the best people who address their fears are the migrants and refugees themselves who can show that they can, they can help the community, that they can overcome some of these problems that people are fearful of, that they can show how they can do that in a concrete way to people. That's the most impressive way to change people's fear, because they, 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 they see what good can come out of the, this particular group, and it maybe it is just a particular group, but it does change their attitude in general to the overall fear that, you know, my neighborhood is changing, nobody speaks English, I don't understand why they, you know, and why don't they help me, I, I don't understand, uh, you know, I hear this a lot for elderly people, in, in towns in the United States, you know, who, who fear that their whole 
society is being turned upside down. And that, and that the, the refugees and the migrants need to know that themselves and understand it and appreciate it. I think it's a very important element of the souls. And the second thing I want to talk about is the, the, uh, uh, this development issue and questions about, you know, the, and I always bring up the question of remittances because now, you know, it's close to $300 billion that's being sent back from countries to other countries uh, in remittances direct, uh, not through the governments, but directly to the families. You know, so it's not corrupt. It's not, it, they know exactly who it's getting to. They know when the money arrives. They know exactly how the money's being spent. And it's a huge amount of money, 16 billion for Mexico alone, you know, every year, you know, and it far outstrips a foreign aid and, and it's almost approaching private investment levels in countries. So that's a huge, I don't know what you call it, potential for development. Now, most of the money is used for private tuition, buying dishwashers and TVs or air conditioners, or, you know, all kinds of things, the luxury items that they, they feel they have to have. And, uh, and that's all right. Uh, you know, you understand why they do that. But it could also, and, and, the, and I think the migrants I've talked to in the United States are, they see the value of building community structures, like building a school where everybody can go to school, not just their family, but you know, all the people. And they see that, they, particularly they see it at the local level, the village level or the, the regional level where they come from, where they say, well, they really need you know, these kind of investments and I could see where that might give jobs, you know, for the young people and for others that, that could happen. And I think more talk about that and how you can do it, uh, I think would be a really valuable kind of movement uh, ahead in this sort of thing. And finally, demography, the, uh, you know, in the United States, we're, we're all t always talking about the Mexican workers, you know, the agricultural workers and all that. Given the birth rate in Mexico, there won't be any young, agricultural workers in about maybe 15, 20 years. So that whole problem is gonna solve itself simply by the birth rate. You know, there don't won't be any young Mexicans coming into the country, certainly not at the wages that we're offering uh, at that stage. And I, you know, I, I often tell policymakers that you have to look a little beyond, you know, the current population to look at what the demography is redesigning. And the only reason America is not in the same spot as Europe and the birth rates is because we've been accepting a million immigrants legally a year and, uh, you know, uh, probably another million undocumented for the past, since at least 1989. And, uh, you know, so our, uh, our population, our demography hasn't really changed all that much in the United States. And that's you know, I think that's an important factor to think about too, you know, how, how demography uh, really affects the future of a particular country and where we're we going with it. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? Uh, thank you. Um, I'll make a, a couple of quick observations. I'll deal with the IDP point afterwards, if we may, just because I want to keep this on, on the international uh, uh, migration issue and a couple of these points will echo those that I made in my earlier round of interventions I like them first time so I'll say them again um, firstly the the issue of development and migration is a complex one it, that relationship is is very unclear in fact there is a credible body of evidence to suggest that a spike in development leads to an increase in migration. Uh, more research needs to be done on it, but I think it behoves us to focus on development as a good in and of itself and not as a tool to manage migration. That, that would be one point I would like to say. I would also like to echo um, Father Richard's comments on remittances. One very simple thing we can do, it has been called for for years, it was called for in the New York Declaration, is to reduce the transaction costs for these remittances, which are in fact over 400 billion a year to developed countries, over three times annual ODA. Okay, this is the poor helping the poor. Currently, the transaction costs are about seven to nine percent. Bring them down to three percent. 
easy. We should just do it, end of story. Secondly, a lot of this conversation, in fact, overwhelming majority of this conversation has been about migrants on the move. We should not ignore also those migrants who are already in situ. Uh, often, I think, in largely vulnerable or precarious situations on a whole, for a whole range of reasons. Which leads me to my, my final point. We haven't really discussed today, and we won't have time to, but I think when we look at the drivers of migration, the root causes of migration, all these words that, that, that we come out with, we shouldn't also ignore the role that informal economies uh, have to play. Uh, I'm not just talking about in the developed world, this is a global phenomenon, but if you look at the, the extent of the economy in Europe, which is informal, it is significant. That is a driver of migration, whether we like to uh, acknowledge it or not. Now, the point here is not to cast blame, just as I wouldn't say, um, the, point, the point is simply to suggest that we have a commonality of interests in dealing with migration. It cannot be simply posited, I would say this, I come from the United Nations, but I also happen to believe it. It cannot simply be posited as a north-south issue, as a developed world versus developing world issue. We share a huge number of challenges, and I think therein lies some chance for a solution. I shall leave it there on that optimistic note. Great. Uh, we've come to the end of our conversation. Please join me in thanking the panel.